Thanks for joining everyone. We'll get started soon. In the meantime, I have a poll. Um, so please let me know your answers and then we'll get started shortly. So for those of you who are joining, these are the results of the poll. So it looks like a lot of you already knew about Snake River dams and their impact on salmon, which is great, but we also have some folks that knew only a little bit or didn't know much at all. So welcome to everyone. Um, and then for the second question, how many species of Pacific salmon are there? You all did a pretty good job. So this was a little bit more of a tricky question. So, there are seven total Pacific salmon species, but only five of them occur in North American water. So these are the Chinook, Coho, Chum, Sockeye, and Pink. All right, it is 6.02. It looks like we have a lot of people on right now. So I'll go ahead and get started with my introduction. Thank you all for joining us today for the Snake River Salmon and the Race Against Extinction webcast. My name is Allie Fisher and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. And I'm really honored to introduce our very special guest tonight. Samuel N. Penny is the chairman of the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee, which is the nine member governing body of the Nez Perce Tribe. Chairman Penny is currently serving his 10th three year term, so that's 15 years as chairman and four years as vice chairman. Chairman Penny has also served on several boards and commissions of different organizations, including the executive board of the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians a Northwest Region Delegate to the National Indian Gaming Association Board of Directors and an Idaho Representative to the Environmental Protection Agency Region 10 Tribal Operations Committee. He has served on the Native American Advisory Boards for the Presidents of Washington State University, University of Idaho and Lewis Clark State College. Chairman Penny received the President's Medallion from Lewis Clark State College in 2003 for his dedication to promoting educational opportunities for Native American youth. Chairman Penny has always advocated to protect the Nez Perce Tribe's treaty rights and natural resources on issues related to air quality, water quality, land exchanges, and megaloads because land, water, and air are critical to the Nez Perce way of life. Chairman Penny defended the Nez Perce tribe against attacks on tribal sovereignty by the North Central Idaho Jurisdictional Alliance on May, Jurisdictional Alliance. On May 17, 2003, the University of Idaho conferred an honorary doctorate of Doctor of Administrative Science to Chairman Penny, 
for helping to improve tribal local relationships. So a little housekeeping, a recording of this program will be emailed out this week and will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org in the WILD blog. Please enter your questions at any time in the Q&A. We normally get a flood of questions right at the end. So the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it will be for me to go through and organize them after our guest has finished presenting. Lastly, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. So offer gratitude to the land itself tonight and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous people on the land today. And the history of tribes in Oregon is complex and nuanced and includes colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have long lasting and current impacts. It is important to not only acknowledge indigenous people and the land, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty and taking action. For example, the Nez Perce tribe has treaty rights to a vast area of land, which will be shown later in some of the chairman's maps. And throughout the treaty making process, the Nez Perce tribe retained the inherent right to fish at usual and accustomed fishing stations and to hunt, gather, and graze livestock on open and unclaimed lands, all outside the reservation boundary. Ensuring that the Nez Perce tribe can continue to do these things that were promised to them is also uplifting their power as a sovereign nation and what the following presentation will focus on. So with that being said, I am going to stop sharing and I am going to share a short trailer of an upcoming film um, or a film that is actually out that the Nez Perce um, created. And then we will go into the chairman's presentation. So give me just one second while I screen share. Salmon was the first one to step up and say, I will give myself to these people so that they can nourish their bodies. Genetically, Salmon has imprinted on our DNA. This is our law that we are following to be on the same level as our food and not place ourselves above it. Here we are trying to hang on to our sacred ways and our foods are diminishing. There's about 3,500, 4,000 tribal members and we caught maybe a thousand fish. So a quarter of a fish per person, if you look at it that way, the fish runs have, have plummeted. Now we're only left with just a handful of places that have the numbers of salmon that we can still actually fish and continue that way of life. Tribal fishing now has been diminished to just a couple places that are fueled by hatcheries. Our returns have been dwindling since the dams have been put in. The dams really are the largest cause of man-made mortality. 50% of the fish die. I have to say, you know, when is enough enough? We turn as many dials in salmon recovery that we're capable of doing. The Nez Perce tribe does the most amount of restoration work of any other agency. There are fewer than 50 fish on the spawning grounds in the best habitat in the United States for these fish. Our back is against the wall. We need to turn some of the larger dials. Some of the larger dials, of course, is dam breaching. The four lower Snake River dams, the amount of electricity that produces is so replaceable. The transportation is so replaceable. Salmon can't come change that. We have to change it because we're the ones that introduced it in their home now more than ever. Our voice needs to be amplified for salmon and for the rest of the environment. We don't forget our obligation and that covenant.
All right, with that powerful introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Penny of the Nez Perce Tribe. Pachigaya and Pachikalawa to everyone, good evening. My name is Sam Penny. I'm Chairman of the Nez Perce Tribe Executive Committee, which is the nine member governing body of Nez Perce Tribe. I'm currently serving my 10th three year term on the Executive Committee and 15 years as Chairman. So I just want to share this first slide with you for those who are not familiar on where the Nespers Reservation is located. And you can see in the map of Idaho, uh, right about in the middle, about halfway up, you see the Nespers Reservation. And usually they refer to this area as North Central Idaho. And you can also see you know, some of the other reservations within, within the Washington, Oregon, uh, Montana area. So we've been working a lot with at least uh, 15 tribes in the Northwest regarding fish recovery. But I just want to show you this map to give an idea where the Nespers tribe uh, 1863 boundary is in our reservation and in relation to other tribes in the Columbia River system. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, begin my comments. So, you know, since time immemorial, the Nespers tribe has occupied, you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry. So since time immemorial, the Nespers tribe has occupied and used over 13 million acres of land now comprising North Central Idaho, Southeastern Washington, Northeastern Oregon, and parts of Montana. Tribal members engage in fishing, hunting, gathering and pasturing across their vast Aboriginal territory. And these activities still play a major role in the subsistent culture, religion, and economy of the tribe. The Nesper tribe is a sovereign treaty signatory with the United States and co-manager of its treaty reserve resources across millions of acres in our, in our territory. In 1967, the Indian Claims Commission adjudicated 13 point million acres as rib Aboriginal homeland based exclusively use and occupancy of the Nesper tribe. And tribes continued to pursue those rights within those areas. And I just wanted to point out in this map that you're viewing. So the, the innermost area is the blue area. That's the Treaty of 1863. And then the next line out is the, the red area, and that's the Treaty of 1855. And then the orange outer line is what they call the Indian Claims Commission Report. So you can see on the reduction of the 1855 reservations, uh, as you look at the map, the 1863 map, just east of the reservation, you see how the straight line goes down. And what happened was gold was discovered in Pierce, Idaho in the 1860s. So when they redid the boundary of the reservation, they, they cut out the gold, uh, the gold fields. So they're outside the 1863 area. So many of our tribe members still refer to the 1863 treaty as a steel treaty, because many of our leaders did not approve that treaty. But that just gives you an idea of the vast area that the tribe occupied. And on this map, you can see some of the, on the, the right side of the map, you see the dark green and light green areas. So those are the areas we're talking about where some of the best habitat fish for fish recovery that still exists. Some of that, a lot of that, Area is wilderness area, but there are prime uh, cold water streams throughout most of those areas. Also, I was recently at an important Oregon a couple of weeks ago, and I was asked a question about the property that the, that the tribe. Well, we don't refer to property, but our homelands within the Northeast Oregon. So when I mentioned the Indian Claims Commission report, so within the state of Oregon, 
the tribe ceded about 2.3 million acres within the state of Oregon. And then, uh, then the, we also own property within the 1855 boundary, we own about 15,000 acres in, in Northeast Oregon. So you can, uh, you can go on to the next slide, please. So this is just a map that is showing you with the, the various dams, eight dams on the main Columbia and the lower Snake River dams. But up in, but up in the right-hand corner, I think is what we think is important at the Nest First Tribe. It says, it says what is a small to adult return? And they just call it SAR. SAR is a percentage of ocean-bound juvenile steelhead that return as adults to spawn in freshwater. SARS must be at least 2% for steelhead persistence. 4% SAR is the goal for healthy and harvestable populations. So as you look at that map, you can begin on the far, far left, you see number one is Bonneville Dam. Uh, number two is the Dallas Dam. Number three is the John Day Dam. Number four is the McDerry Dam. So those are the dams on the main Columbia. Then when you get up to number five, that's the beginning, that's a confluence of the Columbia and Snake River. So number five is Ice Harbor Dam. Number six is Laura Montemental Dam. Uh, seven is Little Goose Dam. And eight is Laura Granite Dam. So I just wanted to show you those two slides so you'd have an idea of some of the areas that, that I'll be talking about. So salmon are on a trajectory toward extinction in the Snake River Basin and likely the Columbia Basin in the long run. The basins are no longer natural rivers. They are a series of slow moving reservoirs, functionally lakes. Salmon did not evolve for this world people have created, and they may not survive if we do not act in time. There is an urgent need to restore the Lower Snake River salmon migration corridor. And those are the four Lower Snake Dams that I just mentioned. By breaching the four Lower Snake Dams to prevent the imminent extinction of multiple salmon populations, Breaching the dams on the Little Snake River would address the greatest source of man-caused mortality, salmon from the Snake River, the largest tributary of the Columbia River. Freeing this bottleneck in the migratory corridor would allow access to the Snake River Basin, vast mountainous, cool water and wilderness areas. So we're phase three converging crisis. First, the Columbia Basin salmon extinction crisis is not around the corner, it's here now. Secondly, the climate warming crisis is not around the corner. It is here now and magnifying the salmon crisis. The slow moving reservoirs created by the dams on the lower state and Columbia rivers are especially vulnerable to warming temperatures. And then thirdly, every day, we as tribes live an ongoing 90-year crisis of environmental and tribal justice. The United States construction of the federal Columbia power system dams on the exact geography of the homelands, waters, and fisheries of the 15 Columbia Basin tribes, creating a modern Northwest for 14 million people, but at the price of our tribal lands, fisheries, cultural, cultures and people. Salmon are our life source. The loss of salmon is a loss of our culture, our health, and our way of life. Extinction of salmon cannot be an option. We've seen Congressman Simpson in his Columbia Basin initiative embrace what salmon need, restoring the lower Snake River migration corridor by breaching the four lower Snake River dams making new, a significant new investment in fish and wildlife funding throughout the Columbia Basin, getting the Bonneville Power Administration out of the fish and wildlife business, 
and reintroducing salmon in the Upper Columbia and Upper Snake Basins. The Columbia Basin issue also embraces the energy and other transactions the Northwest is undergoing and identifies how investing in clean energy and transportation can not only replace the services of the lower Snake River dams, but also ensure a stronger future for all of Northwest. Last March, following a nation nation consultation with the Columbia Basin tribes, the Biden administration issued a statement embracing or emphasizing that it had heard the tribes' voices on these same core salmon elements, starting with the urgency and the importance of restoring the Lower Snake River migration corridor. Last August, the Biden administration publicly announced its commitment to supporting development of a durable long-term strategy to restore salmon and other native fish populations to healthy and abundant levels, honoring federal commitments to tribal nations, delivering affordable and reliable clean power, and meeting the many re resilience needs of stakeholders across the region. The Biden administration made additional public comments, including fully exploring restoration of the Lower Snake River migration corridor through breaching the four Lower Snake River dams. In September, Washington Senator Patty Murray and Governor Jay Inslee issued a report emphasizing that services of the Lower Snake River dams could be replaced and that they are determined to seize the opportunity presented by the Biden administration administration commitments to restoring salmon and to leverage the historic investments made in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act or Climate Bill to support energy replacement, infrastructure enhancement, and salmon recovery and habitat res restoration. In September, the Biden administration through NOAA Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service confirmed in its science report on rebuilding Columbia Basin salmon that breaching the four lower Snake River dams is a centerpiece action for restoring salmon. We've appreciated the Biden administration's acknowledgement that this will take a whole of government approach and that business as usual won't work. And we appreciate the direct engagement we've had with Assistant Secretary Connor at the core. Secretary Holland at Interior, Secretary Graham at Energy, Chair Mallory at the Council on Environmental Quality, and top officials at the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Justice. And Governor Inslee and members of the Washington legislature are advancing state budget requests to refine details on replacing the energy, transportation, and irrigation services the lower Snake River dams provide. While all these represent progress, it's time for good words to be transformed into action. I was on that last statement, you know, about transferring words into action. It already remind, always reminds me every time I go back to Washington, D.C., I always remind. Uh, administration and in Congress about the treaties uh, with the Nez Perce tribe, but I usually refer to a speech that Chief Joseph gave in Washington, D.C. in 1879. And what Chief Joseph stated at that time, he said, I have shaken hands with a good many friends, but there are some things I do, I want to know, which no one seems able to explain. I cannot understand how the government sends a man out to fight us as it did General Miles and then breaks his word. Such a government has something wrong about it. I cannot understand why so many chiefs are allowed to talk so many different ways and promise so many different things. And then he went on to say later in his speech, he said, Chief Joseph said, they all say they are my friends and that I, have, I shall have justice. But while all of their mouths talk right, I do not understand why nothing is done for my people. I've heard talk and talk, but nothing is done. Good words do not last long unless they amount to something. 
And then later he said, I'm tired of talk that comes to nothing. Makes my heart sick when I remember all the good words and all the broken promises. So when I mentioned, you know, that there has been progress, it's time for good words to be transferred into action. And I think what Chief Joseph is referring to that, you know, we could say a lot of good things or we're gonna do things, but if, if we're not actually done, they're just, they're just mean, merely words and uh, they're meaningless. We would urge all of you to take action, to emphasize with all your elected officials, from the president to members of Congress, the governors and local officials, that what's at stake is the extinction of salmon, an event that cannot be seen as an option. We hope that we will see that in the midst of this crisis lies opportunity that doing the right thing for salmon can bring us all together. And then back in 1999, the, the tribe had interviews with several elders and they published a book in 1999, it's entitled uh, Salmon and His People. But there are three elders uh, that have since passed on, but when I read their what they said at the time, you know, really, really touched my heart on what, what they said. So the first one by Alan Stickboo Sr. And he was a historian, historian for the tribe. He was a longtime member of the Nesper Fly Executive Committee. But what Alan said at the time, he said, salmon fishing was considered to be a sacred symbol identified in religious ceremonies. The salmon was looked upon in the same manner as the harvesting of the first roots, and thanks was given to the Henua, the creator, for allowing the salmon to return. The coming of the salmon was a time of happiness because it meant that people had survived the winter. And then the next uh, statement was from uh, one of our elders named Horace Axel. Some of you may know Horace, I've known Horace. But what Horace said in 1999, he said, according to our religion, everything's based on nature. Anything that grows or lives, like plants and animals, is part of our religion. The most important element we have in our religion is water. At all of Nesper's ceremonial feasts, the people drink water before and after they eat. The water is a purification of our bodies before we accept the gifts from the creator. After the feast, we drink water to purify all the food we have consumed. The next important element in our religion is the fish because fish come from water. It doesn't matter what kind of fish, if we have suckers or eels or steelhead or salmon, we honor it next after we drink the water. Then we name whatever fish we have, and then everyone takes a small bite before we eat the rest of the food. The next element is game meat like deer, elk, and moose. That's how we honor the food we eat, especially the fish, but because it is the next element after the water. The Chinook salmon is most favored because it is the strongest fish and the most tasty. Chinook salmon is the fish we try to bring to the longhouse. And again, that was from uh, Elder Horace Axtell. Then the last one I wanted to share was from an elder, his name was Rod Wheeler. And when I read his statement, it made it think at the point that we are and have been at least for the last 30 years, is what Rod said, he said, I'm afraid that in future generations, our people may grow up without having the benefit of tasting a salmon. I'm afraid that is what is coming if man continues destroying natural resources at his present rate. So those are some of the thoughts I just wanted to you know, share with you. Uh, 
I don't know if you could go if you could go to the next slide. So this will be, uh, I think, available to you. But you know, if you want to learn more about some of the things I spoke about, you can contact us by mail. You can visit our website, uh, www.nespers.org. But we left the G off of there. I'm sorry. And then also follow us on other uh, social media platforms. And then in the bottom right is there's also a Salmon Orca uh, website that you can visit. So there are uh, many, many ways you can uh, find out more information. And with that, I will go ahead and conclude uh, my comments. And you know, some of the people you saw in the uh, trailer have been very involved in, in this issue on salmon recovery for many years. And, we have many people uh, within the tribe that you know, are available to you know, speak further on these if, if needed to. And one thing I forgot to mention on the, I think it was the, uh, the second slide was in our fisheries program is one of our biggest programs. So our main fisheries office is, is here at the tribal headquarters in Lapway, Idaho. Probably about 40 miles east is uh, the town of Arpino, Idaho. And we have a fisheries office there. And also just a note, that's where uh, there's two hatcheries there. Uh, the Nespers tribe just took over management in June of the Dorshack National Fish Hatchery. Uh, right across the river is a Clearwater Nadwis Fish Hatchery that is run by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. But just upstream from both of the facilities is Dorshack Dam, which is located on the reservation. And that dam is, of course, it's, I think it is used for flood control, but one of the main purposes they use it for is to cool the lower, the lower rivers. And you no know, timing of releases from Dorshack, uh, that's, I think that's our primary purpose is to release cold water because the, the other, Reservoirs created by dams, it just the waters are just temperatures are just too warm. And then we also have a, a fisheries office uh, down in McCall, Idaho. And then we have a fisheries office located in Joseph, Oregon, where we do a lot of work in uh, Northeast Oregon. So there's one other thing I wanted to uh, mention before I or wanted to know that the tribe's been working on just recently. So I wanted to initially mention that the Nesper tribe has authorized a legal challenge to a recent unlawful, what we believe is an unlawful revision of, to the Oregon fish passage rule. We know and appreciate that there is an alignment on this issue with, with Oregon wild. So in late December, the tribe learned uh, at the last minute with no public notice or revisions were made by the ODFW to Oregon's fish passage rule, which was done after a two year public review process had concluded. The changes altered the court rule definition of fish passage, which has been defined as relational passage for 17 years to include trap and transport as an initial type of fish passage. The full set of changes affects core rule definitions and principles and procedures under the rule, all done without public notice or opportunity for comment. The tribe is treating this revised fish passage rule as unlawful and unlikely to be found unlawful in Oregon courts in the future if, OD, if ODF, ODFW does not reverse its action. But again, we know and appreciate that Oregon Wild has taken a similar position on this unlawful rule revision and want you to be aware of this common alignment with the Nespers tribe. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my comments. And again, I appreciate the invitation and for all of you joining us this evening. Katsuyaya, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Penny. We'll now hand it off to Rob Clavins. Go ahead, Rob.
All right, can you see that picture? Yep, that looks great. Great, well, thank you, Chair Penny. Uh, it is an honor to be able to host this presentation and, and be a part of it. Um, everybody on will be happy to know I'm gonna keep it short so we can get to as many questions and answers as possible. But um, I did just wanna share a little bit more about some of the things that we're working on here in the place that the Nimipu have called home since time immemorial. Um, oops, let me see if I can get my slides to move forward here. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, so yeah, we, we recognize that the, the Nez Perce tribe is a sovereign nation and that they never gave up their claim to this place. Um, having called it home myself for about a decade now, it, which is not even a blip compared to the history of the tribe, I can absolutely appreciate why that is. Um, we've been pleased to partner with the tribe, tribal members, elders, organizations, and staff on numerous occasions. Um, we share a great deal of common ground and enjoy working together where we have common ground, which uh, and common goals, which as far as I can tell is most of the time on most things. And having once been the, the wolf guy for Oregon Wild, I'm reminded of the key role that the Nez Perce played in the return of wolves to the Inner Mountain West. Uh, we were pleased to help secure funding for the tribe to start the process to get condors back to Anma or Condor Canyon, which is now labeled um, Joseph Canyon on current maps. Um, and we've worked closely with, um, with staff on management of Forest Service lands and are even in court together fighting the Trump administration's last minute move to reduce protections for large and old trees. Um, sadly, the the um, uh, the Forest Service is fighting us on that, and we've got gotten no help from leaders like Senator Merkley. Uh, in addition to the damage that would occur on the ground if we're not successful, the Forest Service's excuse me, the Forest Service's treatment of the Nez Perce tribe was abhorrent, and we're pleased to stand behind them in court. Um, and one of the places where we have found common ground with the tribe is when it comes to fish. Uh, and as the chairman just mentioned, just a few weeks ago, we began working with tribal attorneys after the state followed the federal government's lead um, in trampling over tribal sovereignty and treaty rights by illegally and unjustly undermining fish passage rules at the state level. And unfortunately, um, you know, positive change often requires litigation. Back in the 1990s, Oregon Wild was involved in the effort to secure endangered species protection for Snake River uh, Chinook, uh, Spring Chinook, and helped uh, launch the Save Our Wild Salmon Coalition. And we're not a primarily a fish conservation group, but throughout our history, we've fought to protect and restore free flowing rivers in the Klamath, Rogue, Umpqua, uh, Willamette and Snake River Basin. So today we join the chairman in calling on leaders like Senator Wyden and Merkley, Representative Cliff Bentz and Governor Kotek to breach the Snake River dams, restore salmon runs and restore justice for the Nimipu. Uh, one place where we've been working towards the same goal really specifically is to ensure the protection of rivers through Senator Wyden's River Democracy Act. Uh, Chair Penny, along with uh, leaders of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, have been vocal supporters of the bill, and I just want to give a, a brief update on where that stands. Uh, for the uninitiated, the River Democracy Act is a bill that Senator Wyden put forward to protect over four and a half thousand miles of Oregon's uh, waterways as wild and scenic. Uh, a few years ago, the senator put out a call for citizens, tribes, organizations to recommend river streams, uh, tributaries, creeks, and wetlands that deserve protections. And after getting over 15,000 nominations and, and analyzing them in the uh, February of 2021, Senator Wyden put forward a bill that would protect about would have protected about 4,000 miles of the state's waterways, bringing the state's total to a still pretty modest just 6%. Uh, since that time, he's solicited input from across the state, especially here in rural Oregon. And not surprisingly, there's been some ideological opposition, primarily based on misinformation and willful misunderstanding. So earlier this, this winter, after soliciting more feedback, uh, the Senator put forward an updated version of the bill that cut the proposal by well over 30%. Uh, even with those cuts, the bill is still a historically important step in the right direction for conservation of fish, water, wildlife, and other important values. And we're continuing to work with the tribe and other allies to convince the Senator to add some of those waterways back in, including some here in Northeastern Oregon. Uh, for better and for worse, uh, wild and scenic river protections fall far short of wilderness. Uh, unless you want to build a new ice harbor or a Bonneville dam, they don't affect private property rights. Uh, it doesn't prohibit logging, grazing, uh, irrigation, firefighting, recreation, or any number of other activities. What a wild and scenic river uh, designation does do is identify outstandingly remarkable values of a waterway. Uh, those could be things like clean water, fish habitat, or wildlife, cultural sites, rare plants, or scenery, and then ensure that the relevant agency uh, creates a plan to protect and enhance those values within a half mile. 
And amidst a worsening climate crisis, uh, increasing development, and the often overlooked biodiversity crisis, and quite frankly, an overdue need to right historic wrongs, uh, we need to do a whole lot more than this. But along with breaching the dams, this is a st big step in the right direction, uh, which is why the River Democracy Act has gotten overwhelming support from thousands of citizens, hundreds of businesses, as well as organizations, landowners, tribes, and scientists. Uh, even where I live in Wallowa County, where the loudest voices make conservation uh, measures seem controversial, when we tried to compile all the statements of support from just the first year, it required creating a 65-page document to record them all. Uh, the bill received a positive hearing, it's been modified in response to feedback, and now it's, in, uh, it's waiting for reintroduction into the Senate. Um, there's no doubt that with the dysfunction in the House, it's going to be a challenge to pass anything uh, of consequence, but we believe that the bill can make progress and nobody's given up. Um, despite the significant cutbacks uh, that were based on their opposition, the industry and some local politicians, including Congressman Cliff Bentz, have continued to put out misinformation uh, and drum up opposition. So we're not taking anything for granted and need to continue to encourage Senator Wyden to pass the bill as soon as possible with as many deserving river miles as possible. Given limited time, and I've already taken more than enough of it, I'm not going to make the usual case for why this part of the world is so special, but I will ask you to take my and, and the chair's word for it. And I want to encourage you to, to follow these efforts on the dams and, and the River Democracy Act. Uh, please find opportunities to speak up and, and to spread the word. Uh, write letters to the editor, go to town halls, reach out to Senators Wyden and Merkley, uh, encourage them to pass the River Democracy, intact, the River Democracy Act intact and soon. Uh, and if you want to do something right now, you can go to this website, become a citizen co-sponsor of Senator Wyden's bill. If you've done it already, send it to a few friends. Um, we have to be sure to, to praise our senators for good actions like this bill, but we also can't let them off the hook when it comes to protecting our forests and recovering Snake River salmon. Uh, time is too short and the stakes are just too high. Um, as Senator Wy Merkley, sorry, Senator Merkley has reminded us whenever he's asked about the dams, uh, it is complicated, it is hard, and it is expensive. Uh, but that's why we elected them. Uh, silence, sidestepping, and, and delay from our leaders and just good work, uh, just good words, as the chairman mentioned, is not enough and it's not okay. Uh, we need to demand that our leaders earnestly and urgently engage in this work. Uh, they need to support the Nez Perce tribe and all the people and other living things that depend on salmon and bugs and wildlife, wildfires, plants, and all of the parts of a healthy functioning uh, landscape. So with that, I will stop talking and uh, hand it back to um, uh, Ali to manage the questions and answers. Thanks, Rob, and thank you, Chairman Penny. So now, as Rob said, we are going to start the Q&A section of this presentation. There are a lot of questions, so I'm just going to try to get to as many of them as possible. So starting off, um, and Chairman Penny and Rob, feel free to put on your video if you'd like. Um, so the first question is, this is for Chairman Penny. So could you speak about the Wallawa Lake Dam? For instance, is anyone raising money to put a pipe into the lake for Sockeye Passage rather than trucking them around, which is the current proposal due to lack of funding? Yeah, so our Department of Fisheries Resource Management and also our Office of Legal Counsel here at the tribe have been, been working you know, on the issue of the Wallawa Lake Dam and the restoration of sockeye back in, into that area. So, you know, we've uh, worked with uh, Oregon delegation. Uh, I believe there's some funds that have been uh, proposed you know, for that project. Uh, probably the very first time that I ever talked about uh, the Willow Lake Dam and that whole area was uh, in the early 90s, I believe, with the, some of the county commissioner of the Willow County, they actually uh, joined us uh, in a trip back to Washington, D.C. to talk about fish restoration uh, in Northeast Oregon, including Willow Lake. So our, our teams here at the tribe are working on the issue of, of uh, Willow Lake Dam and fish passage and reintroduction in that area. So that's a very important uh, project for the tribe, and we look forward to you know, working with with everyone that uh, in the area to make sure that 
you know, that that is completed because it is important not only for the tribe, but we think it will be beneficial to the local area as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the next question that I have for you is, we have a lot of people interested in viewing the film or wondering if there's a link to the film. So if you could speak a little bit on that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so the film hasn't been officially released yet. Uh, we're planning on doing that in the near future and we'll, we'll be sending out the, the link uh, for that. Initially, it was gonna be at, uh, debuted at, a, at some film festivals, but uh, those, those timelines have uh, since gone by. But we are working on to on a date to release that that film, and uh, we'll certainly put that out there for notice when it's available. Yeah, so we got a sneak peek, which was great. Um, I, for one, am definitely super excited to see the film once it's released publicly. My next question for you is: Could you please speak on the pending permit process for Stibnit Mine endangering spawning waters outside of McCall, Idaho? Well, I can speak generally about it because you know there's uh, the tribe has filed some actions you know regarding that that particular mine, but so it's within uh, in the maps I showed you. You know that's certainly within our. 1855 treaty area. Um, many tribe members still go fishing down there in that area. And, and what they're proposing, we just feel that you know, it's going to dramatically uh, affect some of the downstream waters on their proposed work. So we've made comments uh, about that Stibnack project and we'll continue to uh, monitor what's taking place, not only with you know, the permits from the Forest Service, I think they have to get, uh, I think the Clean Water Act, they have to get a, a permit through that as well. So there's still a lot of uh, steps that they have to go through, but the tribe does oppose uh, that project. So one of the kind of, I'll just call it the Catch-22 that the tribe is in, not only our tribe, but tribes across the country is, you know, we, we want to make sure that we protect our treaty reserve resources, again, not only for the tribe, but for, for all people and future generations. So with, you know, with the administration's initiative to, for critical minerals, I think that's, so we have, we'll have some difficulty there because, you know, they, they're gonna say it's a national security issue uh, the tribe will continue to say that you know it's directly impacting our treaty reserve resources. So, you know that just a general statement. Uh, our legal counsel uh, is keeping track of that Stimite project, and but overall, it it is going to affect uh, our tribe members. Uh, one, for example, I think on some of the work they do. Uh, some of our tribe members wouldn't be able to access some of those areas for at least 20 years or more. So it does have direct impact on the tribe and we'll continue to monitor that through our Office of Legal Counsel. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is, what impact does sport and commercial fishing by non-Indigenous people have on the fish available for Indigenous people? Could you repeat that one more time, please? Sure. So the question is, what impact does sport and commercial fishing by non-Indigenous people have on the fish available for Indigenous people? Well, it, it does have some impacts. Uh, we do work with different uh, groups that have similar interests to us. I think for the fish that are reared in our area, that are spawned in the upper snake uh, our area and then of course they out migrate and some go you know, even up to the Gulf of Alaska and and back which which tribes commonly refer to as gravel to gravel management when they leave uh, 
out migrate and then return as, as adults. So there, they do have some impacts on us. Um, you know, I know there's discussion about the, uh, I think it's called zones one through five on the lower Columbia. Uh, and I think that's from, from Bonneville Dam on down to the ocean uh, on what impacts uh, they would have. So as far as the Nesper tribe is concerned, is that you know there are impacts because a lot of the fish that are reared up here are either by incidental catch, uh, you know, are taken by lower fisheries. Uh, one other thing that that I've noticed is that you know, a lot of the this is probably a whole, a whole different discussion, but when they did the Mitchell Act hatcheries it was supposed to be for returns, I, I believe, above Bonneville Dam. But if you look at our map, most of those Mitchell Act hatcheries are below Bonneville Dam, which to us doesn't make, make a lot of sense. But there's a lot of factors. But yes, it, it does have impact on our uh, treaty reserve fisheries. But we also work with groups that, you know, that share similar interests as the Nespers tribe, especially regarding fish recovery. Great, thank you. Next question is, do treaty rights have any supremacy in the protection of salmon? Yeah, and that question, uh, we feel it does because first the definition of a treaty is a contract between two sovereigns and they were actually at the time peace treaties between the tribe and the federal government. And then when you look at the US Constitution, uh, they, have, they have the Commerce Clause and then they have Article 6, uh, the Supremacy Clause. And within that section, it says that, that treaties are the supreme law of the land. So I find it quite interesting with the current makeup of the US Supreme Court that you know, they're focusing a lot on, I guess, the, I'm trying to think of the term, plain language of the Constitution. To me, it couldn't be any more clear that the treaties are the supreme law of land. And then often the, sec the number two section of that uh, Article 6 is not often mentioned, but it says something like, you know, all judges, all representatives are, are bound by author oath or affirmation to support this constitution, which in our view includes Article 6 and, and the treaties. Thank you. So the next question is, um, the four dams are in Washington state. What role do Oregon state elected officials have on a state level and what entity has jurisdiction? So on the, the Lower Snake River dams, um, I think the important part is just an overall fish recovery because a lot of the fish that we rear up here, they are caught by Oregon fishermen, uh, you know, along, especially along the main Columbia River. Uh, so we work closely, the Nespers tribe is part of the Columbia River the fish into the Tribal Fish Commission, Nesperce, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Yakima. So we work closely with them as well to, you know, support their fish recovery efforts, such as the Deschutes in other areas that, you know, we're, we're supportive of those tribes and, you know, making sure that the fisheries are restored in their areas as well. And again, you know, our interest is, you know, maintaining and protecting our treaty reserve rights, but also there's the benefits to the sports fishermen and the states as well. Thanks. Um, let's see. Okay, next question for you is, how much time do we have? Uh, 
or extinction or well, the Nespers tribe, uh, you saw in the trailer, uh, David Johnson is our Department of Fisheries Resource Manager, and our department has done extensive work uh, you know, studying the, especially the uh, Lower Snake River dams and their impacts, and they've issued what's called a quasi-extinction report, which, which shows that I think there are, I think it was 50, 50 or less spawning in, in some of these areas of returning adults. So, you know, the extinction crisis is, is here. Um, you know, under the ESA, and I think this is where the states would have interest as well, is that, you know, if it ever does come down to a conservation issue, the tribes would be last. All the others, the sports fishermen, everyone else would be affected, impacted before the tribe because the, the tribe would, if there were any con in the future, any conservation issue, the tribes would be the last to be impacted by uh, the lack of the fish. But again, you know, we believe <laughs> we're in a crisis now. That's why we need bold action. And uh, I was at a idle legislative reception last year and was talking to a gentleman who served in the military. And he had a very good analogy. He said, he says, sometimes you have to take bold action. He says people, some people will like it, some people won't. But by taking bold action, at least you'll know where people stand. And he said, that's, then you develop your strategy. He was talking more of a military aspect, but I, I thought that was quite uh, unique in what he said. But I, we believe Simpson took bold action. He was criticized from you know, everyone, but I think you know, a lot of the things that he st stated in his initiative uh, in order to prevent extinction have to be considered and have to be done. Uh, Otherwise, we are on the brink of extinction. Thank you. Next question is, will the affected tribes take the US to court to protect salmon like they did in US versus state of Washington, which led to the Bolt decision? Well, I really can't discuss legal strategy, but you know, we've instructed our our legal counsel, I'm going to speak for the Nespers tribe, uh, our legal counsel that we have here in-house counsel, that we've always, you know, we've always told our legal counsel that, you know, anything we do has to be biologically and scientifically defensible. And, you know, we, we stand by that, that, you know, we look at all those factors and you know, litigation is is always the last option, and you know in the past we've had to take that action. Uh, I'm not sure what the other tribe would say, but uh, that's what we instruct our our legal counsel is that you know, we'll try to do everything we can to resolve any issue. But you know, litigation is always a consideration uh, if need be to protect our treaty reserved rights. Thank you. Next question is, are the salmon in the Columbia River system okay to eat? Are they contaminated? If so, how badly and can it be mitigated? Yeah, that's an interesting question. There, there was just a report that came out recently and I, I can't remember what the, it was entitled, but it mentioned that, you know, that they were recommending that, you know, those that do consume fish that you know, that is more or less a warning that, that the fish are contaminated. Uh, interesting enough, we just had a meeting here with uh, government to government consultation with Environmental Protection Agency. And I can't go into details, but it goes, goes back several years on what they call uh, human health criteria, fish consumption rates. Uh, 
and tribes have a lot higher fish consumption rates than uh, the average citizen. So, you know, some of those effects, especially uh, cancer risk rates and those type of things uh, directly affect tribes and the our membership and the amount of fish that we eat, which is more than the average uh, individual. Thank you. Is it okay if I just sneak in two more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, we have so many. This is great. So the next question is, could you please indicate or speculate where the most promising venue is or will be to actually problem solve the issues and impacts to the various stakeholders of Snake River Dam removals? Well, for the Nespers or for the Northwest tribes, so we have what is called the affiliated tribe of the Northwest Indians, which are tribes from throughout the Northwest uh, has adopted resolutions supporting salmon recovery as well as orca, because orcas are affected as well by the salmon recovery. So the, the tribes are supportive of uh, Northwest of taking action. So that resolution was forwarded to the National Congress of American Indians, which is made up of uh, just about all the most tribes across the nation. They're located in Washington, D.C. They also adopted resolutions supporting uh, salmon recovery and uh, urging Congress, especially Congress, to take appropriate action. So, under the, when we're talking about dam breaching, of course, that, uh, you know, I think some of the federal agencies have certain authorities uh, either at the, in, you know, in the region, but uh, my understanding that you know, dam breaching would have to be approved by Congress. And so we just need to continue to educate Congress uh, on the issue and continually remind the United States government that they have a solemn obligation to uphold and honor the Treaty of 1855 with the Nespers tribe. So I didn't mention earlier, we have, we have several treaties with the federal government, but also within those treaties, we just call it the saving clause. It just says, you know, all provisions of former treaties are still in force effect. So the hunting, fishing, gathering, pasturing rights are all still uh, valid and in, in effect for the Nespers tribe. Thank you. I have one last question for you, and it's a good one that a lot of people are asking, and it's what can we do to help? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think you're working with your, of course, your congressional delegations, your representatives and senators, and also your, you know, the state elected officials, you know, letting them know that that you're aware of this issue and that you know, we are at a critical stage that action needs to be done. But we often talk about the status quo and you know, if we stay on the status quo, they're certainly going to go extinct. And uh, I think the status quo is not acceptable. I think the uh, salmon are in, icon for the whole country and especially in the Northwest because you know a lot of people, especially tribal people, depend on those fisheries. So I think contacting your elected officials uh, about the issue, um, you know, writing them letters. Um, I'll be going back to Washington DC again next week. You know, we've got several meetings scheduled and um, so I think the, the best way is is to you know contact the elected officials. I think on the slide that I mentioned earlier, that if you want to learn more information about any of those issues, uh, you can go on the Nespers Tribe website and you can click on our Department of Fisheries Resource Management uh, uh, site, and you can see all the work that the, the tribe has been doing at, as far as fish recovery. So I think just that contact with elected officials. Uh, with the administration and Congress and your elected state 
uh, officials, senators, representatives will will go a long way in at least educating them on issues. I think there you know, may be misinformation or other scare tactics that I'm not being put out there. So we also make sure that you know the truth is getting out. Um, you know, one thing I've often stated, you know, I'm just about serving my 30th year here at the Nisper's Tribe, but one of the things I often tell our council is that you know, a lot of times those people will say, especially federal officials will say, you know, we want to utilize the best scientific, biological, and scientific information available. And sometimes you read the, the news and of course, it comes down to, you know, whose who science are you going to rely on? Um, I mentioned the NOAA paper and, you know, some of the other papers that talk about dam breaching. So when I, when I talk to our council members about that, that, you know, using the best scientific biological information available, I tell them, well, sometimes that goes out the window and becomes strictly a political decision. And I think of it, it's going to be strictly political or politicized. I think the salmon are in true danger of becoming extinct. Thank you, Chairman Penny, for your time tonight and for your wisdom and for this amazing presentation. If any of you would like to rewatch or share the presentation with your circle of contacts, it will be available on our website, OregonWild.org, in a few days. So feel free to spread this as widely as possible to make sure people hear what the chairman has to say about this very important issue. Um, thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining tonight and for spending the time to um, join us for this presentation. Thank you, Chairman Penny, again, and thank you, Rob. I hope you all have a great night and See you for the next webcast. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.